Due to the unavailability of the Council's chaplain, I will now ask Reverend Will Gibbons to say prayers. And so following the atrocity on London Bridge last Friday, we stand in silence and we remember those who died and those who were injured and all those who've been affected in any way. God of unfailing compassion, make us strong in the face of terror, loving in the presence of hatred, bold in our diversity, always knowing that your hand holds us and your life sustains us, today and always. Amen. Almighty God, we pray for our meeting this evening, that all councillors serving the borough of Wigan, by integrity of word and action, may uphold justice, truth and peace, and your will be done, for Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And finally, our special prayer for today. Almighty God, as your kingdom dawns, turn us from the darkness of sin to the light of holiness, that we may be ready to meet you in our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Can I remind members of the need to respect each other and I will continue to chair these meetings fairly and to show impartiality. Likewise, members of the public are welcome but should be aware that they should not interrupt the proceedings as disruption may result in removal from the public gallery. The rules of conduct for the meeting have been circulated in advance and the meeting and copies are on your seats. Are there any apologies for absence? Apologies for absence. We have Councillor Clark, Councillor Dewhurst, Councillor Evans, Councillor Grundy, Councillor E. Holton, and Councillor Marshall. Are there any further apologies? Councillor Winstanley? Thank you. Mr. Mayor, can I, sorry, Mr. Mayor, can I just say that Jeanette. Uh, Councillor Janet Prescott is on her way here at this moment. She intends to be present. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Minutes of the meeting held on the 11th of September 2019. I will move the acceptance of these as a correct record. The seconder. Thank you. Can I put the minutes to the vote? All those in favour of accepting the minutes, please show. That is carried. Mayor's announcements. I have in front of me a Lifetime Achievement Award. It gives me the greatest pleasure to congratulate Councillor Peter Smith on receiving this Lifetime Achievement Award, which was presented by the Local Government Information Unit. Councillor Smith has been honoured for his commitment to improving the borough, including being the driving force behind the deal, the setting up of the Believe in Lee Fund and in attracting large-scale cultural and sporting events. He has also undertaken a considerable amount of work at regional level with AGMA and then the Greater Manchester Combined Authority and is still undertaking some of that work. On behalf of the Council, I would like to congratulate Council, Councillor Smith on receiving this prestigious award. Empower. Which councils are best? May I also... <laughs> May I also congratulate Wigan Council in keeping its good value rating in the which councils are best list. The council has been ranked third out of 150 councils. Well done again to Team Wigan. The In Bloom Awards. I am pleased to report that Wigan Borough has won 39 awards out of 30 entries in the Bloom Awards. A full list of the awards has been circulated to all members of the Council in advance of this meeting. The Council also managed to retain its silver gilt and best in category status. Can I say well done to all those involved in the In Bloom Awards. The APSE Service Delivery Awards 2019. 
I am pleased to announce that Wigan Council's highways team won the best service team with the highways winter maintenance and street lighting service in the APSE service awards. Well done to Wigan Council once again. Get It Load Lottery Award, Stuart Persons. It is also pleasing to report that Get It Load founder Stuart Persons from Wigan has been awarded the Local Legend Award as part of the 25th Birthday National Lottery Awards. This is one of only 12 prestigious awards in the UK. Since 2005, Stuart has arranged more than 400 Get It Load events in libraries throughout the UK. So well done, Stuart, on this award. The Horse Racing Award for Kieran Fallon. May I also report that Kieran Fallon, son of the jockey Kieran Fallon, has received the trophy for Top Apprentice Jockey, an accolade handed over to him at Ascot earlier this year. This achievement is even more remarkable given that he only sat on a racehorse two years ago, having shown no interest in racing in his younger years. His early sporting success was playing either football for Shevington FC or rugby league for Shevington Sharks. Congratulations go to Kieran on his award. Town twinning visit to Angier, September 2019. I should like to place on record my appreciation to the officers involved with the arrangements for the town twinning visit to Angers in September. In particular, may I thank those who assisted with translations during the visit. This is a beautiful city and the friendship and the hospitality of its people will remain with me for a long time. The Northwest Good Neighbour of the Year Award. I would like to congratulate Tracy Renox on winning this prestigious award. Tracy works as a school transport helper on the bus to Newbridge School and also works as a helper at dinner time at Westfield School. She has lived in the same road for 30 years and has supported her neighbours well during that time and this has now been recognised with this award. So well done to Tracy. The death of former councillor Steve Murphy. It is with deep regret that I refer to the death on the 7th of November 2019 of former councillor Steve Murphy. Steve represented the Hinder Green and Oral Wards of Wigan Council during his time as a councillor. Our thoughts are with his partner, councillor Eileen Rigby, and their sons, Alec, Ben, and Sam, during this difficult term. The funeral service was held at Chernock Richard Crematorium on the 26th of November. Any donations can be forwarded to Guide Dogs for the Blind. I now invite members of the Council to express their condolences in respect of former Councillor Steve Murphy. <coughs> Mr Mayor. Councillor Smith. Mr Mayor, I've first met Steve Murphy about 1980 through Terry Wynn. Uh, Terry was just elected as councillor in Hindley Green and Steve was one of his great helpers. Uh, and I'm proud to say I've re <coughs> regarded Steve as a colleague and a friend for all those years. 1984 was a big year. George Orwell got it right. It was a big year for Steve Murphy. Starting off with the minor strike. Steve was a loyal member of the NUM. I don't agree with everything, but he was there. He was loyal. He was part of the strike. So he, uh, he got active at his own colliery of Bickershaw and round. And then later on in May of 1984, he was elected councillor for Hindley Green. And it was quite fortunate that Steve was able to provide a link between the council and the striking miners' families. So we were able as a council to direct our help to where it was needed in the borough. And I think, Dave, we were very proud that we received a plaque, which is in the, in the town hall, saying how much the miners appreciated the support they got at that time from Wigan Council. And again, it's all down to the work that Steve did and helped us to do that. 
Uh, as I say, Steve participated in, in picketing uh, at Bickershaw, and uh, it was pretty low key. The deputies didn't, didn't go on strike at first, and they, they had a friendly kind of banter as they came in. And then one day, Steve told me, the flying pickets arrived from Yorkshire. And the atmosphere was a lot tenser. And so the first car arrived, <laughs> stopped the car, and the guy got out, one of the deputies, a guy called Stan Wall. Now, he's more famous, Stan, not as a deputy, of course. He was a well-known rugby league referee. So all these fine black pickets from Yorkshire, being good rugby league fans, recognised Stan and began to talk rugby league and not the content of the strike. So any tension, any was relieved by, by that thing. So Steve, I think, was a bit relieved about that. Uh, and of course, in a sense, Steve's experience in the strike of what the police were doing and not doing uh, meant that in 1986, when we had a new form of governance of police, and we as a council could appoint somebody to the police authority, we appointed Steve Murphy as our representative. So we went off uh, and served on the police authority. And within two years, Steve was the chair of that police authority. And he served as chair of the police authority for 16 years. And he always made sure of two things. He wanted the police, he saw the police's role protecting the public as being very important. So he made sure they did that. But also he made sure they operated within the law. And he made sure that. And he's had to deal with uh, three very different, I think, chief constables in his period. Uh, the first one took more instructions from God, I think, than he did from Steve Murphy. That's for those who can't remember him, James Anderson. Uh, a Wigan, actually, uh, a long time ago. Uh, then David Wilmot, who I think Steve got on very well with on a personal basis. Uh, and finally, uh, Mike Todd, who Steve appointed, very ambitious policeman, but uh, tragic circumstances meant to his loss of life. So Steve caught with all that. And he was so respected, I think, that even uh, in those days, technically, the magistrates could have changed the chairman of police authority. But Steve was so well respected for his work he did in Greater Manchester and across the country that he was well supported by the magistrates over that long period of time. Uh, in 2004, a soldier and we had all out elections in Wigan and it produced some pretty bizarre results, one of which was in Hindley Green and poor Steve lost his seat. So we lost that uh, a council, we lost somebody who's all his services, and particularly the police lost their services. Uh, but at least he had a bit more time, I think, to watch his favourite rugby team, Wigan Warriors. Now, when uh, in 2011, uh, Michael Winsley was our mayor and uh, another big Wigan Warriors fan, uh, and he was gr very pleased, of course, that in that year they won the Rugby League Cup. So we held a reception for them when they came back. And uh, Michael, remember, it was a shocking day. It was absolutely steroids coming down. And when we got to the little dais to greet the team with the, in front of the public, who was right in my eyesight, a first row, Steve Murphy. A bit bedraggled because of all the rain, but he was there loyally supporting uh, his, uh, his team. So uh, that was great. And then later that week, on the Thursday, a bit of role reversal, really, because, of course, Steve then was re-elected to the council at the expense of the mayor, uh, Councillor Winston. So uh, Steve got back with us. And in that sort of second period of, of time that he served on the council, he concentrated perhaps more, obviously, uh, couldn't get back involved with police authority, things would change, but he, he did a lot of good work, obviously, in his own ward. He wanted to work hard in his ward, and he particularly got interested in the proposed Greater Manchester strategic framework that suggested there might be some uh, economic development around Junction 26 of the, of the M6. So Steve asked if I'd meet residents. I was a bit nervous, but uh, Steve assured me they'd be all right, and they were, they were all right. So we had a good meeting. And then I promised him that, uh, you know, whatever happened, I said, I'm not, we're not making our mind up yet what we'll do, but 
I'll keep you informed, I'll keep you in the loop of what's going on. I said, thanks very much. And then a few weeks later, phone rings. My secretary said, I've got that councillor Murphy on. He's in a terrible state. He's in a real bad mood. So what have I done? Anyway, took the call. Steve accused me of all sorts. He told me Steve can. Uh, uh, and apparently he'd seen something in the press and said, you'd, you'd not told me. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I, I just about convinced him that I didn't. And I promised to go away and look into it. And it turned out that the highways agency, in announcing a scheme that we'd been funded from around Pemberton, had added on, and this would make a good link into this site, with no, no uh, permission from the council, no intention of the council to do that. Anyway, so we wanted to sort that out, and we ended up as, as friends in, in that situation. So, you know, I, as I said, I've known Steve for a long time. He's been hardworking, loyal, conscientious, very intelligent, and very determined. Bloody awkward at times, but very determined. And uh, those uh, ideal qualities for someone to be an excellent counsellor. And Steve was, for so many years, an excellent counsellor. Uh, and, you know, I, I miss Steve would come and tell me things and give me advice, and I would listen to what he said. So I'll certainly miss him, miss the, miss him friends. But obviously Eileen, Sam, and the rest of the family will miss him so much more. Uh, we send our deepest sympathies to you. And, you know, we're always there. I won't forget Steve Murphy and what he did for this town, for Greater Manchester. Uh, and we've, we've lost a really good colleague. Councillor Prescott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for allowing me to speak this evening. Before I go any further, can I just offer Jeanette some of my own personal uh, deepest sympathies to Eileen and their sons, uh, Hassan, Ben and Alec. Mr. Mayor, when, when Steve was elected to represent the Oral Ward in 2011, he chose to join the Regulation Committee, Licensing Committees, and sometimes later he became a member of the Planning Committee, all of which are quasi-judicial decision-making bodies and committees that until recently I had the privilege to chair. It was through his membership of those committees that I uh, came to know Steve, who I found to be a hard-working and dedicated member, a man with definite opinions a man who was not afraid to say what he thought, a man who could take you through his reasoning and logic for holding those opinions, a man who I came to respect and whose friendship I valued. Steve was a larger-than-life character, not just physically, but in his presence in a room. It would be true to say that Steve and I had, on occasions, had, how, they, how did I put it, had a frank exchange of views on a number of subjects. But that provided a broader platform for the good working relationship that we formed as colleagues, who I, be who I believe had a mutual respect for each other. He was a person that I, for one, would always want on my side in a fight, someone I would have chosen to champion my cause. When he took on a matter he was relentless in his efforts to achieve a satisfactory outcome for the person or persons he was representing. Take it from me, Steve was known for his speaking and his sharing of his opinions. But from my own personal experience, he was also a very good listener. A few years ago, when I needed someone to listen to me, he gave me his time. And that is the most valuable thing that any one human being can give to another. He gave me his time. I will miss him, and I'm sure many of his colleagues, and I know his family, will miss him greatly. Thank you. Councillor Winston Lee. Oh, 
Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, on behalf of the Conservative group, we, we would obviously like to extend our condolences and sympathies to, uh, to Eileen and her family. And uh, I re really endorse what Councillor Prescott and Councillor Smith have said because uh, obviously after I finished my term as mayor, my exiting was, was caused by, by Steve beating me uh, in, in that, uh, that hard-fought but clean, clean election. And uh, democracy will always prevail. And uh, it's fair to say that when I got back on the council, we didn't always see eye to eye. We, we sometimes had a robust exchange of views Views, but actually looking back now well, that's all really irrelevant isn't it we um, you know we, we have our own standpoints we, we fought our own corner and at the end of it you know we we, we put our differences to, to to one side and and we but we did have a, a, a shared interest and that was uh, Wigan Rugby League Club and many a time I, I would see him at, uh, at the rugby or even the grand final as we tend to tend to get to grand finals every now and again as Wigan Warriors so um, and I know it, it, it will be an absolute terrible shock to the family having lost my father in exactly the same way I know uh, and I can empathize with what they are going through so certainly on behalf of the group we do extend our sympathies and condolences thank you Mr Mayor Councillor Parkinson I didn't know Steve that well, personally, but I'm proud that Eileen has become a friend over the last few years. As lots of you know, as a new councillor, fighting elections is hard, but I'm proud to say that Steve turned up more often than not in Standish to help me leaflet, to canvas, and just to be there with support and kindness and friendship. Yes, he was outspoken, but what he said was usually flipping right. So I just want to send my love and thoughts to the family and a big thank you to Steve. Councillor Walker. Yeah. <coughs> if I can just add a, a little anecdote um, that probably that shows a little bit the calibre of the man. So when I first met Steve and got involved with him a little, um, it was during the miners' strike. And um, at that time, um, I, I suppose that in our neck of the woods, we were a fairly, fairly moderate um, uh, group of individuals. But one of Steve's strengths was recognising the hard times that some of our miners went through. And, and there was, it was very easy to say, uh, uh, and, and one of the things that was said locally, not locally, sorry, by some of the outsiders who were telling us how our miners should react, because some of our miners, particularly those without families, who had to subsist on almost no money, some of them took other jobs. And that seemed perfectly okay to me. Um, but it didn't to them. That was somehow being a traitor. So I'm not talking about going back to work down the pit. I'm talking about being a bus driver or a bus guard or, 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 or just getting something to get by. And... and there was this accusation from some outsiders that that, was, that made you a traitor. And there was also one or two that did go back to work. But even they, you know, they'd been out for six, eight, nine months. And, and they were really struggling. And they, again, had no income. Um, and, and Steve saw those as, as real human beings who'd really given their all and, and they weren't breaking ranks. They were ju they just reached saturation points. Uh, and we did have, as I say, some of those outsiders that came into the borough uh, who wanted to call them traitors. And Steve was very clear and made it clear to those of us outside the industry, and I was Trades Council Secretary at the time, that these weren't traitors. These were people had gone far beyond what anyone could expect but eventually they'd been forced back to work uh, and 
that really, that, that, the way he put that over to us, and there was a lot of people booing him. You know, this wasn't an easy explanation he gave. You know how easy it is to be in, in the boo brigade because, you know, it sounds like you're... And so uh, and when you stand up to that, you know, it takes some balls. And Steve had them. And, and so afterwards, when he got involved with the police, and, and at the same time as he was with police, I was the chair of the Greater Manchester Fire. And so, of course, we got, at, we got involved outside in LGA business. We became quite leading figures. And, and he kept, I kept on seeing that human side to him. You know, he was as tough as boots. You know, he could really, could give people a hard time. He wasn't a soft touch. But that human recognising, you know, the breaking points and, and when people had given their all was just, it just really re-emphasised what a grand human being he was. And I just, I was just proud to have been his pal. Thank you. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Just want to give our condolences on behalf of the Makerfield Independents and say how brave you both are being here and our thoughts are with you. Thank you very much. I have written to offer condolences and our thoughts go to the family for their loss. Arlene and Sam have left a book of condolence for members to sign after the meeting. The London Bridge attack. It is with deep sadness that I have to report on the recent attack in London last Friday where Jack Merritt, 25, and Saskia Jones, 23, lost their lives. The Council observed the National Minute silence on Monday of this week and our thoughts go to the families for their loss. At this point, may I ask those present to stand for a moment as a mark of respect for former councillor Steve Murphy, Jack Merritt and Saskia Jones. Thank you. Declarations of interest. The monitoring officer has provided advice to all members and relevant guidance has been issued. Members are asked to consider relevant interests for the purpose of this meeting. And if there are any interests, members must leave the room during the relevant item. Please fill out the form on your desk if you do need to declare an interest, I'll return this to Christine at the end of the meeting. There are no updates from portfolio holders this evening. Constitutional issues. The Council is requested to note that as of the 5th of November 2019, the following changes have been made to membership of Cabinet. Councillor Sweeney has stepped down as the portfolio holder for planning, environmental services and transport, and Councillor Paul Prescott will take on that role. Nominations have been sought for the Labour positions of Chairman and Vice Chairman of the Planning Committee and Chairman of the Licensing and Regulation Committees. The following nominations have now been received for the vacancies. The Chairman of the Planning Committee, Councillor Hellier, the Vice Chairman of the Planning Committee, Councillor Greensmith, and the Chairman of the Licensing and Regulation Committees is Councillor Hellier. Councillor Kenny has also indicated 
that he would take up the Labour vacancy on the Planning Committee but would step down from the Children and Young People's Scrutiny Committee. Any outstanding vacancies will be determined at a later date. Can I have a show of hands on all those in favour of these nominations? All those against? That is carried. Hay Parish Council. The Council is asked to note that at its meeting on the 9th of September, Hay Parish Council co-opted the following as parish councillors. Angela Goodman, Paul Kenyon and Colin Hyam. The Freedom of the Borough, the Duke of Lancaster's Regiment. We have a report on page 23 of the agenda which asks that the Council grant the Freedom of the Borough to the Duke of Lancaster's Regiment. I invite the Leader to move the recommendations. Leader. Thank you, Mr. Thank you for that, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I have great pleasure in moving this report. I can't honestly see there being any objection to this. It's a well-deserved uh, honour for, for this regiment, uh, and I know the town will fully support what we're doing here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Are uh, there are recommendations seconded. Do any members wish to contribute? And I'll go to straight to the vote. All those in favour of accepting the recommendations are set out in the report. All those against? That is carried. Local authority governors. The council is requested to approve the nominations for the appointment and reappointment of school governors as set out on pages 31 and 32 of the Council Agenda. Are the nominations moved? Moved, Mr. Mayor. Are the nominations seconded? Seconded, Mr. Mayor. Do any other members wish to contribute? Go straight to the vote. All those in favour of accepting the nominations as set out in the report. All those against? That is carried. Policy and budget framework items. Antisocial behaviour, reference to motion from council meeting held on the 17th of July. At pages 35 to 56, we have a report of the Director of Transformation, which was considered by Cabinet on the 21st of November, and which relates to the motion submitted by Councillor Watson in July 2019. I invite Councillor Anderson to move the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm pleased to move the recommendations of the report of the Cabinet dealing with Councillor Watson's motion. Both Councillors Watson and Gerard were at the Averton and Tilsley SDF meeting, which provided a briefing on the new community resilience team and they had the opportunity to ask the questions they wanted to. And even following the, the cabinet meeting last week, they also had a private meeting with the community service, community safety manager to outline any queries they may have had. The new social harm model will provide a tenure blind service in the place focuses on positive outcomes for residents. Robust enforcement action will be taken when the evidence justifies it, but a blanket zero tolerance approach carries risks with it, removing discretion from officers and possibly criminalising people, especially young people, with long-term detrimental consequences. It, does, it also raises expe expectations of severe enforcement with the public, which cannot be um, Im implemented very easily. The police definition is that antisocial behaviour covers a wide range of unacceptable activity that causes harm to an individual, to their community or to their environment. This could be an action by someone else that leaves you feeling alarmed, harassed, or distressed. It also includes fear of crime or concern for public safety, public disorder, or public nuisance. What is apparent is that there is no clear definition. Indeed, both of the descriptions would be criticized for the vagueness. So to illustrate the point, ASB can range from children playing, babies crying, cockerels crowing, to drug use, verbal abuse, and threatening behavior. In the light of the complexity, the approach taken here in Wigan is to deliver an appropriate intervention with partners to all reports of ASB. We have what we described as a continuum of enforcement, an incremental staged approach to enforcement action 
whilst acknowledging that some serious cases will go straight to urgent enforcement to safeguard individuals, families and communities where necessary. In response to a serious issue, the SB service has been redesigned into a single tenure blind team based in a place managing cases from early intervention and prevention right through to enforcement where necessary. This enables us to focus on people. We want to remove the simple labeling of people as a perpetrator of ASB or a perpetrator of crime when the behavior is seen as different or odd or is in the early stages of being wrong. We want to work with people at the earliest opportunity to assess risk, to ensure we promote tolerance and to deliver the right intervention at the right time. We want to encourage people and communities to live in harmony, to be more tolerant of each other and ultimately to be more resilient when faced with issues. The new service is designed very much with deal principles in, at heart. We have an excellent partnership working in Wigan through the Community Safety Partnership, and this is recognised at a greater Manchester level. We must also note the work already achieved and being further developed through our housing strategy on homelessness and with registered social landlords. This is crucial in order to expand, expand our options when accommodating complex people and families and ensuring their integration into the community. Eviction on its own is very rarely a solution as it often exposes and exacerbates vulnerabilities and moves the issue to other places. I personally relate to this after working in social housing for over 30 years. In summary, our refreshed approach in this area of work has a clear focus on identifying risk early and ensuring the right intervention is delivered at the right time by the most appropriate service. This enables us to focus on what is important, and that is people. We want to work with people at the earliest opportunity to assess risk, to ensure we promote tolerance, and to deliver the right intervention at the right time. We want to encourage people and communities to live in harmony, and to be more tolerant of each other, and ultimately to be more resilient when faced with issues. I move. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is the recommendation seconded? Do any other members wish to contribute? Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd also like to thank Sarah Owen for her thorough and relevant report, and I welcome the opportunity to engage with her team to help resolve this issue. However, although I acknowledge that antisocial behaviour covers a wide and varied range as defined by the 2014 Crime and Policing Act, it would only be reasonable and practical to award the most severe punishments available in a zero tolerance approach for those who generally cause harassment, alarm and distress. Common sense needs to be applied here as dirty looks, babies crying and poorly kept gardens should not be categorised as antisocial behaviour. Due to categorising such a wide range of issues under the label of ASB only favours the worst offenders and allows them to continue to cause distress within our communities. Consequently, this will only delay Wigan's community resilient team's new five-step model to the final stage where enforcement begins, and this will only empower the victims at the final stage. ASB and this council's policy regarding its zero tolerance approach is something I inherited when I joined this chamber in May, and it's not unique to just the residents of Averton. This is above a wide problem and does not hibernate throughout the winter months and is currently ruining, li ruining lives by our inaction Regarding, reinforcement, uh, regarding enforcement. Due to this, I would recommend that the ASB case review or community trigger should be immediately reduced from the current three reporting incidents in a six month period to just two incidents for activation. The first time you break the rules, it's a mistake. The second time is a conscious choice. And the third time is a slap in the face for the good, hard working, honest residents within our borough. This reduced two-strike recommendation is based on the research from the Victims Commissioner 2019 report, Antisocial Behaviour, Living the Nightmare by Baroness Newlove, and is supported by the charity ASB Help. Jennifer Herrera, Chief Exec Executive Officer of ASB Help said, paying attention to the victims of antisocial behaviour through effective usage of the community trigger will give them the protection and support they deserve. Yet, it also has the potential to identify perpetrators and embrace early intervention, which could stem, help stem the tide of crime. We are appalled at the way victims continue to be fobbed off by agencies and are left to suffer in silence with a hugely detrimental effect to their quality of life. This is further reinforced by Baroness Newell's report, 
which highlights examples of police and council staff failing to appreciate the cumulative impact of persistent ASB on its victims, with each incident being treated in isolation and the underlying causes being ignored. This culture of diminishing ASB fails to recognise the impact that it can have on mental health, one's ability to hold down employment and the strain on family relationships. Finally, as much as I support this report, especially with the emerging priorities that offer clarity to our residents on how, where and when to report ASB, the information regarding the ASB case review must also be given to the victims as well as the perpetrators as soon as possible. And as previously mentioned, a reduced two-strike activation for, for the current three-strike model. Only then will we, we will be able to empower the victims rather than the, perpetrator, rather than the perpetrators who have been exploiting this lack of enforcement within our boroughs and it's currently ruining lives. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Gerard. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, I welcome the initial report so far over this issue and the actions taken so far on the Council's website, which it makes it more clear for victims of ASB to report issues and give them advice on it. But only by putting political allegiances to one side, working together and doing what is right for our constituents is the only way we can achieve great things on this issue. By adopting the recommendations of Berenice Newlove and enforcing a zero tolerance on serious ASB by the powers already afforded to this council. What is clear though is we need to determine collectively what we define as serious ASB. As I think Councillor Anderson uh, referred to, it's, there's such a, a wide ranging uh, set of issues, uh, some that shouldn't really be on there. I think when we talk about ASB, we all know really what we're on about. Uh, but ASB, it's not a low-level nuisance crime and should it be treated as such. The results can be devastating for anyone who finds themselves a victim. And it can have long-term effects on the victims, be it mentally, physically, emotionally and financially. I myself, along with my family, was a victim of ASB back in 2010. I left the Navy, I settled down in Lee, bought the house off the council. Councillor Anderson was my councillor at the time. And we had major issues with a certain family in the, in the area. So much so that I had to leave. I had to go, leave, leave my house, my family home, I set down routes, leave, go renting a house off my brother back in Atherton, hence where I'm back now being a councillor for Atherton. And that family was treated better than what my family were who were causing the ASB, uh, uh, anti-social anti behaviour. Not only was they afforded an extension of stay in the, their own property, once they'd made other people's lives misery and they actually was evicted, they got moved to another area and made their lives misery in that area. And lo and behold, this same family now is living around the corner from them. That cannot be right in anyone's imagination. I've lost a lot of money over, through this, through this behaviour and the inactions of the police and the council in the past. And we cannot allow it to happen again to other people. As councillors, we know there are housing problems out there. Good people stuck on a seemo seemingly endless waiting list to get into social housing, to set routes and provide a stable future for the families. Yet, we as a council seem to be constantly dealing with the same culprits over and over again who are a major source of antisocial behaviour and crime. It's not just ASB we're dealing with, we're dealing with serious crime in some cases where we are housing them. Yet, we seem happy to house these people all at a cost, not just once, but multiple times in different areas, moving the worst offenders about from area to area without penalty, as I've alluded to, costing taxpayers Repairing properties, rehousing, investigations, etc., all comes at a cost. Yet we have an allocations policy and tenancy agreements that should protect residents from constant ASP and protect this council from picking up the cost by enforcing these policies. 
Why is it that a hard-working, law-abiding family who may struggle financially to pay rent and council tax be subjected to court action, penalties added most times within a couple of weeks, if not days, yet people who are breaking other sections of their tenancy agreement are afforded months, years to change their ways. This is totally unacceptable to the victims of ASB and cannot be allowed to carry on. We need to empower people more, and I urge this council, which is what was in the main motion, uh, to adopt Baroness New Love's recommendations. And the main one, which I do know works personally, is by reducing the community trigger from three reports in six months down to two. You know, six months when you're a victim of ASB can seem like a life sentence. And we need to empower people more to get the agency working together. And we need to inv inform victims more clearly about the community trigger. I know it's a bit more clear online, but if they're reporting to the council, I know when people report it to me, I do tell them about it, but we need to tell people clearly about the community trigger is. Councillor, I'm afraid you've run out of time. Okay, thank you. Leader, as you didn't speak earlier, would you like to speak now before I ask Councillor Anderson to sum up? Uh, Councillor Anderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Obviously, I, I welcome uh, Councillors Watson and Gerard's um, support for the report. And uh, obviously, I note your comments in relation to the implementation of powers, etc. And we have, you're right, um, placed a community trigger on the website recently uh, and that hopefully will lead to a greater awareness of that in our communities um, but i want to reassure you that first of all that actual robust action will be taken where the evidence justifies it and um, we have a lot stronger partnership working now with the police and other agencies in this borough through place-based working than we used to have and we need to focus on the interventions that work for everybody like you and like most members in this chamber we will not tolerate um, neighbourhoods being brought down by repeated antisocial behaviour and we expect action to be taken in those circumstances but the, the holistic approach needs to be taken and appropriate action taken in individual circumstances depending on those circumstances thank you mr mayor uh, we move to the vote all those in favour of accepting the recommendation are set out in the report. Please show. All those against? Motion is carried. Financial monitoring quarter two. At pages 57 to 72, we have a report that recommends that the council adopt the amended capital programme 2019-20. I invite the leader to move the recommendation. Leader. Recommendation, Mr. Mayor. Is the recommendation seconded? I'm seconded, Mr. Mayor. Do any other members wish to contribute? Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, reading through this report, uh, there's a couple of things that strike me. Uh, but the main one I want to speak about is we've reported a million pound loss in planning fees. So, well, if it's 900 and something thousand, it's near a million. So when we take that over the whole year, that's gonna be looking at not far off two million pound. But what strikes me about planning fees is it's simple. Let's stop waiving fees for big developers. Now, every time I turn my TV on, I see Mr. Corbyn saying we're going to do this against millionaires and billionaires, but yet this council, Labour Council, wears fees right, left and centre, 106 money fees. It doesn't matter what type of fees it is. If a big developer comes here, they want to build here, I know we need the council tax money, but we should not be waiving fees what should be going money back into our community, especially when we've got this type of shortfall. Is that allowed? Advice like that, Mr. Mayor. I don't think that is. Can we just have one meeting, please? Come on. Leader's getting advice there so he can come back at me. Well, it's true. That's what's just happened. We've all witnessed it. 
Would, would Paul McKevitt give me advice right now, Councillor Mr. Councillor Jones, I'm, I'm sure you'll have the benefit of his advice. Number one, I want advice of our top person in finance now about what I... Come on, let's... Uh, I couldn't get continue. that. Continue. Well, continue, just get on with it. Shout, shout it out. One meeting. Actually, it's a good point I just raised. All councillors are equal. Point of order if you want to speak, Councillor Molyneux. So, I'll just point it in general. So, when we're talking about nearly £2 million, but we're waving over a quarter of a million pounds on a development in my ward, I can't understand what's going on. So, I would like some clarity to that. That's all, Mr Moore. Thank you very much. Councillor Maiden. Oh, well, yeah, it's good to see Paul McKevitt over there. I thought you'd gone missing because I'm still waiting for a feasibility study off you regarding these market traders. But it's Councillor, good. we're not discussing council officers. Oh, right, Stick thought, to the point you want I to make. We, I'm after some advice, you see, because the Labour Party seems to be able to get some advice off the financial director. Yeah, I'm just going through his report here. It says the markets are losing money. They're not losing money. They're in profit by 385,000. And this is more mental arithmetic again, Mr. McKevitt, of your financial report. It's Councillor, like a, could try not to mention officers' names, well, please. Stick to wants, the report. If he wants to come down and give advice to elected members, then he's fair game for me. Well, unfortunately, yeah, that's unfortunately. not... Them's not the rules I'm trying to enforce, Councillor, so please. Okay, then, well, try not to mention... Officers' names. I'll obey the rules, just make sure they do then, Mr. Moore. So the markets are in profit by 385,000. The 320,000 you're quoting here may be the down on previous years, but it is not operating at a loss. Can we have some, you know, can we have something in this report to say that? Thank you, Mr. Moore. <laughs> Councillor Walker. I think it's important because I'm conscious that we've got one or two members of the public left up here because one of the things that we do as planning and I as a member of planning committee is we want to encourage development, affordable homes uh, in sometimes very difficult pieces of land which under normal circumstances that it, it wouldn't be profitable to develop them. So, because, <coughs> for instance, if they've got severe um, old mining subsidence on them, so that's got a huge financial cost. Before you do any of the work, before you start building the houses, you have to do something about that mining subsidence. It, <coughs> and that's a sort of typical example, but also, in some of, the area, some of the areas of our borough, houses don't sell for what it costs for the land and all, all the building costs and the development costs. So in those circumstances, so I'm not talking about some of our pretty outlying areas, I'm talking about some of our inner areas. We have to, if we don't waive those fees as he calls them, those, that section 106 money, then we'll just finish with, we'll continue to have a derelict piece of land. So, you, and you're fine with that, I'm sure, but I'm not fine with that because those, so... Can talk to me? Don't. Sorry, sorry. So, for instance, a couple of council meetings ago, we approved a piece of land where all the houses are going to be affordable houses, you know, and but affordable houses means less expensive than the market would normally expect. Um, but there are in areas where we wouldn't be selling them well for what they cost. And I, I just want to emphasise that there's that there's horses for courses in this sort of development. Wigan is not all Aspel and Loughton, and even Loughton's got some problem areas as well, and we've been and seen them because we do site visits. You know, <coughs> <there's coughs> we often struggle to get some of the opposition on our planning committee, 
But those that come know that some of these sites are very difficult to develop. And without, that, without waiving, they're not really fees, but the charges that we would normally charge, we would finish up, as I say, with totally derelict land. And that's quite different from the sounds that were, that were being made that would be very nice in an election address, but would not give affordable housing in this borough to our residents. Councillor Prescott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I, I just rest the issue that Councillor Jones has, has brought up this evening regarding the wavering of 106 fees. Um, this often happens, and it happens on the basis that where uh, a development has come forward, its viability may be in question if the, if the authority enforces the 106 fees. We also have a responsibility as an authority to provide a five-year supply of housing land. So we have a commitment both at national and local levels. Those fees, the 106 fees, are a legal agreement whereby we enter into with the development to provide a number of things. We ask the developer to provide those things. But if we enforce that, try to enforce those fees, what you are left with is a piece of land that will go undeveloped. We will not be able to maintain our five years supply of housing, of housing land, which the government expects us to do and which we are committed to do. That they are the real reasons behind why those 106 fees are wavered. It, it's for those purposes. And, and if Councillor Jones wish, wishes to, to meet with me, I'm happy to discuss the matter with him uh, at his leisure. Councillor Jones, one meeting, please. Just, there's other people. It's not a point of order, is it? Mr. Mayor. Well, I, I take it you're speaking about a specific development, which I'm unaware of. Yeah. Right. Commercial, commercial viability is something that is subjudice and is not put out there for obvious reasons. If you want to talk to me about specific issues, about 106 funds, I'll make myself available and we can have that conversation. But they are the reasons why we waver in these cases, 106 funds. Councillor Collinson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was just listening to what Councillor Walker was saying there about these reports and, uh, and whatever. And to reiterate what uh, Councillor Jones said, we had a meeting with the planning uh, people. I won't mention their names because we're not allowed to mention names. But during that meeting, we were ask, asking specifically over two issues regarding the Bryn development, of which there are four phases within that development. And we were asking to see the, 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 uh, the report that they justified for re uh, removing or waiving the requirement for the developer to pay 106 money. And also, not only that, they waived the requirements that the council had put in initially for uh, affordable homes. So that developer is building houses on the Bryn development, the first 147 houses, there are no affordable homes and no 106 monies either. We wanted to know the reasons why. And we were told that a report had been compiled and um, it had been compiled by a private company. Uh, and all we asked for was, can we see the report? Can you tell us what's in the report? And we were told commercial confidentiality. We weren't allowed to see it. Could you tell us the name of the company then that, pr that, that wrote the report? Again, commercial confidentiality. So, it starts to make you think there's something dodgy going on. Uh, it really does, because the, the 106 monies is basically to help develop and, and negate the impact of that development on the local community. Prior to this development taking place, all we had was a green field. So, you know, we're still in the same situation. We don't know why uh, this happened. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Gerard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Now, getting back onto some kind of topic, I welcome the, the report on here. Uh, but just to uh, point out on the 106, 
I know it's quite a bit of a contentious issue for a lot of councillors and, and wards. Uh, but in my role on the planning committee, I've noticed over a few meetings that this waving of 106 money is becoming quite a bit of a, a regular occurrence. Uh, it's something that I do question, as, and, and a lot of Labour councillors do question as well. I, I will give them the, the credit. But uh, we do need to start looking. We, we, we're having all this housing being built. We can't just keep allowing developers off because they can't afford, or the, the profit margins aren't going to be as big if we, we uh, charge them the 106 money. We need that money for the infrastructure, for them to support the houses and the people that are going to be moving in there. So I'm just hoping as a council going forward that we look a bit more into this 106 because it's, it can't be keep reoccurring like it is doing over the last few planning meetings what we've had. Thank you. Councillor Brealey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, 106 monies. It's a, it's a really narrow merge in what uh, Councillor Walker was on about. Now, under the constitution of Wigan Council, developers are supposed to meet with ward councillors to discuss investments in the area from the 106 monies of £1,750 per house in the ward. Alder Lane development, Persimmon Homes. Nine, 84 houses, 106 monies. We were told they've been swayed. Again, Bellware, 99 houses. Again, 106 monies have been swayed. We asked the developers, well, we asked the planners, why? Has all this money been swayed? The land's contaminated. Okay, send us a report. Why do you want the report, councillor? Because we've got contacts where a young lad who's just passed out from Oxford University with honours can read them reports because we don't understand them as lay councillors and we don't get any help from our planners, planning department, now, I made that uh, request to the head of planning. Sorry, not you, Paul. <laughs> um, the planning officer. Next thing, I get figures. 106 money's been paid. And all the lane, 84 houses. And then 106 monies have been paid at Bellways, 99 houses. But the money's not coming into our ward. It's going into other wards because the planning officer has been in negotiations with the developer saying money's needed here, money's needed there. We don't get it. We was going to be fobbed off by saying the land's contaminated, 106 monies have been swayed. But we're not, we're them type of councillors, me and Paul, who don't take, put, take all these lies from officers. Again, go on, Mr. Moore. Councillor, on. Try, try not for a second. How do I, how do I explain? Tell lies. How do I All explain right. somebody telling me lies well, if you can't by not saying just, lies? Well, it might be a good idea to say they can't explain to you. Well, I'd seen them to tell lies because they are lies, blatant lies. But unfortunately, you can't say that. All and right. then another development on Spiff Lane. It's not in Abram Ward. It's in England Green Ward, 200 houses. 106 money's been paid. Where's that money gone? In Abram Ward, in other wards, West Lee Ward. When do we get it? When do we actually get it? Now, Mr Walker, you keep on about, uh, well, there might be mining's underneath. Well, there's lands. If a developer buys that land, don't they do land surveys? And if, there's, if that land is not feasible to make profit on, they'll not buy it. So why are you backing them up? Saying, well, the sway in 106 money is because they need to make money. Our lands. We've got people coming into our area. We need players. We need 106 open space. We need infrastructure in. We need schools. 
We need everything what that £1,750 gives us. And you're backing a developer up. There's some of Sally Rogner, Councillor Walker. I mean, there's a house in Bryn. There's 157 houses being put up in Bryn. I went down, they're that close apart. Sorry, they're that close apart. <laughs> I mean, they're, o they're only the legal limit of 600 millimetres. But well, that's inc incorrect. It's supposed to be 900 millimetres for a wheelchair access to go down the side of a house. Right? Now, each house, the cheapest house on that site was £220,000. Do you think, how much more profit do you think they've made on that house? I'd like to know. I'd like somebody in planning to tell me how much profit they make for us to swear £1,750 for our 106 monies. That's what I'd like to know, because that's what you're doing, Councillor Walker. You're encouraging builders to say, oh, there's something wrong with their land. We'll put it back, we'll put it to Wigan Council, because they'll swear it. Thank you, Madam Councillor. Lord. Councillor Prescott, yeah, I think you've spoken once on this, so unfortunately, no. Councillor Walker, you've spoken once on this, so unfortunately, you can't speak again. Leader, do you wish to sum up? It's always oh, a pleasure. Sorry, does the deputy... No, right, well, no, sum up. It's, it's always a pleasure and never a chore to answer certain questions from that side of the house. Can I, can I just say, firstly, you, you, men, you mentioned about planning fees, and I think you were quoting the report on page 63, where I think you said there was a half a million. Nine, it, 900,000. 900, it's, it's, 900, it's actually 90,000. Considerably less, and that's because planning fees have not yet come in for certain developments. That's what Paul just told you. No, it's not. <laughs> no, I told you. No, it's not. No, it's not. That's, that, that's something he didn't tell me. I worked out out all for myself. So I accept your apology on that one. <laughs> and also, Steve, I'll call you Steve. I don't point at anybody. I really don't. So just leave that out because that's something I don't do. But what I do know is that there's opportunities, certainly for your group to have a position on planning which you've not took. And obviously you're getting quite excited about it. And what we must always understand, there's always going to be difficulties in developing certain places in this borough because of what you've touched on, land conditions. And at the end of the day, we do need the affordable housing. We do need young people to have the opportunities. And you're right, we need the infrastructure to support it. But it's getting that balance right and it's getting that development right. Can I just say that we have never waived any planning fees? Because that, that was the concept that this, this debate started off at. We have never waived any planning fees. But there are certain times when you come into agreements with developers to develop sites that we've argued in this council about funding from central government to support land that can't be developed properly without an investment to do it. And that is something that we need to do to deliver the houses that we need. There's no argument in that. The population is growing, people need more houses. That will happen. And unfortunately for us, we've not always got the sites that are fresh off the shelf just to deliver it. And we've got to make sure that the finance stacks up to do it. So all I can say is, I didn't spot a load of planning issues in, in this report but obviously we've had a discussion on it. But what we do is right. And we've received the balanced budgets again, or telling us that we're going to get there. And some of the figures quoted were incorrect. Well, all I can say, Ma uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm more than happy to move this report. We'll now move to the vote. All those in favor of accepting the recommendation as set out in the report, please show. All those against? That is carried. The Housing Revenue Account Rent Setting 2020-21. Can I remind members who are council house tenants that they will have a personal and prejudicial interest. They can stay for the meeting 
but they are not allowed a vote. On pages 73 to 80 of the agenda, we have a report which was considered by Cabinet on the 21st of November. The Council is requested to agree the recommendations as set out on page 74 of the agenda. I invite the Leader to move the recommendation. Happy to move, Mr Mayor. Is the recommendation seconded? Thanks to second, Mr Mayor. Do any other members wish to contribute? Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, let me apologise for my misreading the figures. Councillor Mullen is correct. But I did get a good debate going, to be fair. So hopefully I can do again here. But I'm going to get my figures right on this one. A 2%, not 0.2, 2% increase in rents. To our most worst off people in our boroughs living in council properties. And again, I want to make reference to the Labour Council, who've got so many money trees growing at the moment, they're giving everything away, but yet we're going to put a rent increase on people. Now, 2% doesn't sound a lot. This year it might not be. 2% next year, the year after, the year after. Before you know it, this is a lot of money. For the party, that's for the many, not the few. This is no Labour Council. This is... This is well, I won't say it's Conservatives. I don't think the Conservatives would put this much rent up. But I'd love an explanation. If we have such a brilliant balanced books, as we keep saying, on why we need to raise rent and how much will this actually raise us in general and how much difference will it make? And will we be giving more back to our tenants? So clar clarity on that. And I hope I've not made any mistakes in that, but I'm sure Councillor Molyneux will pull, pull me up on it. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Brealey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Follow me speak. Um, yeah, the rent arrears, we always keep putting rents up, but we never look at why. The contractors going into properties and the, what they value it, they do the work, they sign it off. And we just say, yeah, OK, check. I mean, I went into a property in Ingley Green and I couldn't believe the actual work that was taking place in doing this property up for lettable standards again. I mean, and, it's, and it was a company who was charging thousands. Now, I pulled this up a few years ago of what this company, this certain company, charged us... £63,000 to do a council house up inside. Didn't knock it down and rebuild it. They just did it up inside. A brand new kitchen, five grand. Councillor, I'm going to have to ask you to stick to the rent. We're discussing the rent. Well, this is why the rents keep going up, uh, Councillor. Because <laughs> of, of the expenditure of paying for... It's, Repose, we're discussing rent, the rent rise. Yeah, so. well, the, well, how do we get to a rent rise? I'm going to have to, have uh, to uh, ask uh, you uh, to uh, stick uh, to just uh, talking about the rent rise. It's not my job. A, a, a rent rise is based on the expenditure of them councillors' rents are, too, uh, are not enough to cover our expenditure of repairs. Have you ever been in business, councillor? I don't think you have. Stick to the rents, councillor. I'm sticking to the rents, councillor. Where is the where is the rise coming from, and why is Can it? Can I ask you to stick to the the rents, the rise in the rents? Well, it's Not it's why it's happening. So it's going up two percent because our expenditure is too high. It's our valuations of repairs, or is it? Is it that not what it's about, is it? No, you're going to have to stick to just the rent rises, councillor, not the court. The rent rises. Come on, come on. Where's the financial officer? Why is rents going up? Because our expenditure of repairs are really, really high. That's why rents are going up. Is that all I'm, I'm allowed to talk on that? No, you're going off the point, councillor. That's I'm what I'm saying. 
Well, can you explain to me why the rents are going up 2%? Is somebody going to explain why people are paying more for a property that it... Nobody's, nobody's putting any repairs in it. They're paying rent for a property. What, what inflation? Yeah, but why, why are we getting inflation? <laughs> The, the repairs. Co Councillor, oh, God, a minute. I'm gonna, I think, I think let's not to get send, into a debate as to, to, to why. We're, go, we're moving off the point and it's getting into a free a for all here. I'm going to have to ask you to stick to the rent. Disgraceful, yeah. Absolute disgrace. This is why the council's in the state it's in. <laughs> Councillor Gerard. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. If I can just explain to Bob, I think, why the rents are going up is because the government uh, told the council, I think, to reduce the rent by 1% from 2016, was it? 2015. 2015, so it's gone down 2% in the last couple of years, I think. So now the council are putting it back up, back to 2% at the first opportunity they get. Uh, what I'd like to know, though, is a couple of things on the report. Uh, sorry, it's just gone off my iPad. I'll be a second. Right, on the uh, point three, it says all Wigan and Lee Holmes Limited, 80 properties will transfer to council ownership before the 31st of March 2020. And the dwelling rents and service charges are included in the rep report above. I've looked through the report, I can't see that, so I, I can't see, uh, we we'll never have some clarity on that, of, of what the actual rents are from the Wigan and Lee Holmes, the 80 properties, and is their rent rise, is it going to be 2% or is it going to be brought in line with what the council properties are and would that be more than 2% uh, rise, if you get my meaning. Uh, and also about the, the garage, it's in there about the garage uh, rent increase. What I like, I think, to cut, cut to the quick is basically the, all these rent rises, is the income from that going to be ring fenced to uh, invest in our council estates to make them a bit more user friendly for the, the residents up there? Because there's been little investment over the last few years on uh, estates such as Agfold and what have you. Uh, and I think the money raised from this, if it, if it does get approved tonight, needs to be ring fenced to put back into them communities and not, not anywhere else. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Maiden. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, going to what Councillor Walker said, you spot on about the inflation. It is at 2%, but wages are stagnating. In fact, they're going, I, I forgot what the word is, but they're slightly going back on stagnation. So the price, the price of living in a house, the cost of living is going up by 2% and you're right about that. But people's incomes and people who found themselves in council property are usually on the lower end on minimum wage. It's a burden what I think we could sort of say, no, we can let that go another year. Let the economy get back on its feet. Let the general election get over with. Let's see if there's any minimum wages increases or spur wage or whatever. I just think it's a, for 2% on the council properties, it just doesn't seem a lot to sort of gain. And I know you was talking about building affordable houses with that, but I don't think it's enough to build affordable houses. I think, I think it is too detrimental to people in a working environment at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Halliwell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, um, if you'll indulge me, I'll try and give a bit of background and it'll hopefully pick up some of the questions raised by the members, by the members opposite. Um, in uh, July 2015, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer announced that social housing rents would reduce by 1% each year for approximately four years. What this effectively did, this decision, was reduce housing benefit costs borne by the central government and it also reduced the an estimated annual rental income year on year and this, this year it would be about a million pound. 
I'd also ask you to consider and note that this means that the annual rental income is now lower than the figure which was used to calculate the buyout of the £99 million loan that was taken out in 2012 as part of the HRA self-financing arrangements. Now, and this is the important bit. Members will also recall back then that the government instructed an instruction to us for councils to buy out of the old funding system. So we had no choice. The council therefore financed a loan of about 99 million against a steady increase in rental income. <coughs> and that was planned and programmed in. This decision within the three years to reduce but then rents by approximately 4% over then years has effectively resulted in a shortfall in our plans of about 30 million. So they basically instructed us to take out a loan and then we were forced to reduce the rent, but they didn't tell us that. So the, the cumulative loss has been somewhat significant. Between 2020 and 25, the government has now said we can increase dwelling, re sorry, <coughs> dwelling rents by up to CPI plus 1% uh, based on that figure of September each year. And the main purpose of this, clearly, is to give councils and social housing providers some certainty and security in order to plan and invest in existing stock that allows for inflation and things like that and materials and the change and so on and so forth and the resources that go behind it and providing the social housing and, and also any new bills in the future. So the CPI figure for September 2009 was 1.7%, meaning the maximum rentees, rent <coughs> increase that some could use was 2.7%. Now on the 7th of November, the, these recommendations went before the Housing Advisory Panel, whereby all the options to keep dwelling rents below the government guideline had been considered, government guideline being 2.7. These options included reducing the rents by 1%, freezing rents and increasing by 2, keeping it 0.7 below the, act the actual cap. The options to reduce or freeze the rents were considered and debated, however these were deemed to be too financially marginal because investment in HRA stock is required and it needs to continue in order to maintain the decency home standards across our estates and also to continue in to invest in new stock to replace those sold on the right to buy. Now, at that particular meeting, there are tenant representatives alongside of panel members and all the tenant representatives taken from our housing estates all agreed and voted unanimously that they would take the recommendation of 2%. And it was debated that it was required to maintain the decency home standard and also to replace any of those sold under the right to buy. By keeping it below the cap, so we didn't take the 2.7, the, the tenant reps and the panel agreed 2% seemed a reasonable, uh, a reasonable amount to increase it to maintain the standard of the houses that we currently enjoy across Wigan. So effectively, we've, we, we haven't taken it up to 2.7. The tenant reps agreed that keeping it back that 0.7 would actually save them about 52 pence a week. So effectively, the rent increase is about 1.51. I would also remind members that about two-thirds of our tenants in our houses are on some form of benefits or other, so that will be paid, not will come directly from them. So, Madam, Mr. Mayor, I should say, um, it was a difficult one for the tenant reps, but they represent the voices of the people at that housing advisory panel, and they thought that was a reasonable amount considering the... Um, the, the Councillor, you related to town. Deputy Leader, do you want to say anything? Leader, do you want to sum up? Yeah, yeah thank you, Mr. Mayor. Obviously, it, it, it's always a, a, a difficult task when you talk about councillors' rents, it, it, and it has been for a great number of years. But what I would like to do tonight is pay tribute to the tenant reps who actually give their time to come in and come to meetings and, 
and discuss the issues that, that it's important to council house tenants. And they took on board uh, the report, they studied the report, and I believe the meeting went on uh, and there was a lot of good debate. So I'd like to put on record my thanks to the tenant reps uh, for all the work that they do over the year on behalf of their uh, fellow neighbours uh, on, on the estates in this borough. I think Councillor Halliwell has covered all the points that are necessary and the questions have been asked, have been answered. Uh, so I'd like to move the report, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll go to the vote. All those in favour of accepting the recommendation as set out in the report, please show. All those against, that's carried. Treasury management half yearly review. On pages 81 to 94 of the agenda, we have a report which was considered by the Audit, Governance and Standards Committee and Cabinet. The Council is requested to agree the recommendation of Cabinet, which was to agree the report. I invite the Leader to move the recommendation. Leader. Move the recommendation, Mr. Mayor. Is the recommendation seconded? Seconded, Mr. Mayor. Do any other members wish to contribute? <laughs> Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was hoping I wouldn't be first up this time. Um, beginning of this year, I attended uh, an audit meeting. Uh, it was only meant to be, I was going to stay on it until we could hopefully get one of our other councillors on it. And I was quite shocked at what I heard, and it, this is what relates to this background. And it's how we borrow money as a council, and you'll see it in the, in the graphs. And it took a while to get my head around it. I'm not the, the best with, with numbers. So I asked some questions in there, and the officers was brilliant. They was dead honest. They said, we borrow money if the interest rate is low, even if we've nothing to spend it on. And... I found that strange, and I thought maybe it's just how it works, how councils, other, all councils do it. But then looking at the numbers, when we talk about the, just the amount, and we're still just paying ones off from 30 years ago, we've got them coming in weekly, sometimes millions at a time, just in case something goes wrong. That sounds like a game of Monopoly to myself. And I think any advice would be given to anybody in debt, would be, don't borrow any more money. You say our books are balanced, but yet we're borrowing for the sake of borrowing. A private company, a successful businessman, or woman for that matter, would not operate in these ways. They would not just take loans out for the... The truth is, if you lose a couple of million pounds here or there, it doesn't matter as much as it would to the private sector. So you're gambling with the taxpayers' money. So what I'd like to see going forward, and I don't have all the answers, they, they, you know, they, I understand this is complicated, but I'd imagine most people would look at this the way I'm looking at it. What I'd like to see is us look at bringing our borrowing right back down. Look at improving our town to make money, make it more vibrant town. We've talked before about things like our markets uh, losing money on. Well, let's do something which brings more money in town, because more people want to come. There may be times we have to borrow a little bit to spend some. But this, and I'm sorry, I, I do keep saying the Labour Party, and, and before I was just having a bit of political digs, I, I was having a bit of fun. But it does seem that the ideology of national and local is with the Labour Party is to borrow, borrow, borrow. We can borrow, we can get that. But let's remember 2008, I was a, a subcontractor on building sites, no work at all. And it wasn't just the Labour Party, it was national. But other countries wasn't affected as worse as us, and it comes down to this over-borrowing that we keep doing. But please, everybody, I know you're gonna vote with it, take a look at just how much money we borrow, and ask yourself this, you went to a debt manager, would any of them say to you, to improve your financial situations, borrow more money because interest rates low, rather than just in case, do you know, Mr. Mayor, they keep calling out to me and challenging me. Press your buzzer and challenge me on it then. Yeah. That's how we do it. I'll take any of you on. It's great fun, but stop it. I've had about 10 of them yeah. today mouthing let's, at me. Let's, you listen, got the let's listen to what he has to say. If you haven't got the courage to face me in the arena, button it. Yeah. Because I'll stand up to any of you. But I don't want any more now 
people Councilor, challenged me quietly. Sorry, Mr. Stick Mayor. To the point. So, on closing, in closing, like I was saying, never would we see debt management say, borrow more money if you're in trouble. So let's have a let's have a look at it. Let's start acting a little bit more responsible with the taxpayers' money. It's not our money, and let's remember they're our boss. And I think, I don't like austerity, but I think just tightening up a bit, looking at where we're going wrong, where we need to borrow this money, I think we'll make this town a better place. Mr. Moore, thank you very much. Councillor Walker. I think it is worth just recognising that the council, as you quite rightly said, has got a lot of debt and it's coming up for renewal, it's coming up because it's ending. <coughs> and if we, for instance, if we took out a loan 30 years ago at 6% and we can now borrow at 2%, why wouldn't we pay that one back and you and and then continue with the loan at two percent it's just common sense and that's how it works that's why each day we've got people examining all the incidents that are happening to get it right if we didn't do that we'd be lumbered with really dear debt so it, it's not and just to point out something else, because it is complicated, but when you're talking about housing, and I think it's important for us all to remember, we keep on referring to this housing revenue account. Many years ago, so this housing revenue account, many years ago, governments decided that they didn't want... Uh, what? Can, no, you can, didn't say can you, it. Let's stick to the... The yeah, Treasury no, Management no, half yearly well, review, well, please. Yeah, and we've that's done the housing revenue account. So the government said you can't you can't spend money out of the rates on council housing. So you know, we'll we'll let you off the rent increase this time. It's got to come out of this housing revenue account. And all that money comes from rents. Councillor. So, so I'm, I I'm, we've heard enough. Yeah. <laughs> Sit it, down. It's just important. I've asked you, you stick in, yeah. you don't go stick to the point. Then yeah, no. I'm, but I I'm, think I'm we've trying to shut everybody up okay. when they don't stick to the point. Yeah. That includes no, you. No, no, that's fair comment. But I think we've all got the point that... Uh, that well, as long as you I, don't I, mention I, the housing revenue account. No, I, I won't, I won't. But I do think that when we've got high interest loans and we can change them for very low interest loans, then it's absolutely obvious we should do it. Because sometime in the future, interest rates will go up. And the more that we've got on the very low levels, the less it will cost us when we have to borrow at the higher levels. Thank you. Councillor Maiden. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Crikey, I don't mean to counsel a senior councillor than myself on finances, but you cannot borrow your way into prosperity. You're talking about loaning money at 6% to pay off a smaller loan at 2%. That inflation is at 8%. Anyway, I just thought I'd point out anyway. He can't come back, can he? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Jeanette Prescott. Through you, Chair. I was at the same meeting as Councillor Jones, and I think he's a little bit confused because... The borrowing, sorry, the borrowing was what he mentioned was 6%, was to take out a new loan at 2% to pay the 6% off. But they also said that they watched the loans because if the, the rate came down and there was a project that they knew they were going to be doing in the future, then they would borrow it at a lower level to save money for the future. But also to club some of the loans together by borrowing at a smaller rate to finish a lot of loans off. You were at the same meeting as me at, when it was spoke about, and it does make sense because if you're paying a high interest and you can get it at a lower level, then you're saving a lot of money. But by clubbing a lot of debts together that are coming near their ends and taking one loan out that's at a lower level, you're saving this council money. And that's what their job is to do, to save us money. 
And all councils do borrow. You're not aware of it, I know, but all councils borrow money. And when we can borrow at a lower level to save this council a lot of money, then that's what we should be doing. So we should be thankful that we've got a good committee that watch these things. Otherwise, we would be in a problem with our council money. But we haven't because we've got Ian there. He does a good job. So we should be backing them. Councillor Brealey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just one question. What are we borrowing for? We've got £90 million in the bank. What do you want to borrow for? You know, we're such a councillor of the year, belting council, but what are we borrowing? What are we borrowing money for? All right. There's a company down the road, they don't need to borrow any money. They put, they put their rents up on our property by 87%, and we've allowed it. Why is that? If we put council house rents up by 87%, there'd be uproar. Councillor, I'm going to have to ask you to stick to the I'm point. I'm just asking why, you know, I'm just giving an example. But it, right. It's not an example. Of course it is. 87% they put, put the rents up on a facility. I know, I know that. I know, I know. But yeah, I could, I'd, li I'd like to see what we're borrowing for. Mr. Moore, if, it, if possible, can you please explain why we need to borrow money when we're financially sound? Thank you, Mr. Moore. Councillor Halliwell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, whenever we come to financial reports or half yearly reports, um, some of the opposition, I won't name them, you know who they are, hint at, um, hint at irregularities, financial irregularities, things are not being told to us. And I'd remind Council that. And we, all Councillor know, and we all know why we want Lane Gunnard. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So, what, what, what I would... Councillor! Let's just have one meeting. What I would remind members, Mr. Mayor, is uh, our accounts, the way we run our financial situation here at Wigan Council is independently audited and I stand to be corrected on this but year after year after year after year unqualified accounts very highly recommended they go through audit every single time there are no financial irregularities taking place here at Wigan Council we run our finances with due diligence and we do it properly as some of our members have just articulated tonight about taking a cheaper loan out to pay something else out it's not a point of order, Sorry. Mr. Mayor. Ask him what is ask Sorry, him what his point of order. Is. If there's a point of order, a ask him it stops it is. until we hear the point of order. You should ask him what it is, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, uh, what is your point of order? Do you know that we've mentioned irregularities? We haven't. We've just said misspending. That is not. We that haven't is said not, irregularities. Councillor Mayor, that is not a point of order. Can, no, it's not. No, it's not. Counts. Councillor Alliwell, continue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, year on year, as long as I've been a councillor, some 20 years, I've, I've, I've only ever seen good audit reports, good financial due diligence carried out by officers, overseen and scrutinised by councillors after councillors, year on year on year. And yet you'd, you'd listen to the opposition and you'd think there's something very wrong with this council. <laughs> Why do you think we have been voted the best council, or one of the best councils in this, in this country. It's because we are, and it's because of how we manage our finances and how we deal with the services we deliver to the people of this borough. And it ain't as bad as they painted out. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Raymond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I just remind my colleagues that when it comes to local authority borrowing, we have to abide by something called Prudential Code. 
and we borrow to hedge the risk in the future and to save the money. And the wonderful example is under borrowing, heading of borrowing is Her Majesty Treasury on 9th of October increased 100 points in margin over guilt shields introduced in October. Because we borrowed the money before October, we saved 10.6 million in interest repayments in future. So that is why we borrow when the interest rates are low. Thank you. Deputy Leader, do you wish to speak or shall I go straight to the summing up? <laughs> no, right, well, if, well, if, you don't, if you don't wish to speak, it might be a good idea not to speak. Leader, can I ask you to sum up? Uh, but all, I'll, all I'll say is there's been a lot of sound advice being given, uh, certain from this side of the, the chamber. I'm not so sure about the financial advice given from that side of the chamber, but I know which one I'm likely to follow. Year after year, as Councillor Halliwell says, uh, the auditors come back and tell us how, how good this council is run, how good its finances are run. And believe you me, uh, they don't give awards out like giving smarties out. You win best council of the year because you are the best council of the year. And that is why you're sat on your own over there. Because we, on this side, are part of the best council of the year. You too could be part of it, but you cease not want to be. On the number of, and can I just say, Mr. Mayor, continuously tonight, Councillor Brunis yes. wanted to interrupt everybody who spoke, but doesn't want to listen. And it probably yes. happened to him at school as well. He never wanted to listen. No, you need to listen. Yes, can I ask you to be quiet and let's listen to what the leader has to say. No. Councillor, In councillor. Word, no. no, you can't. And one of the reasons is you never listen when you get it. Can I just say, Mr. Mayor, that I am quite confident, as I have been for the last 20 odd years we've sat here and gone through our budgets, that we are getting it right. And every council, certainly in the North West, that look at what we're doing because we are getting it right. And we will continue to do so. And there's businesses and there are successful businesses. We fall into the category of a successful business, Mr. Mayor. Happy to move the report. Now move to the vote. Will all those in favour of accepting the recommendation as set out in the report please show. All those against. That's carried. We will now move on to the Audit, Governance and Standard Committee annual report. On pages 95 to 106 of the agenda we have a report which was considered by the Audit, Governance and Standards Committee and Cabinet. The Council is requested to agree the recommendation of both meetings, which was to agree the report. Is the recommendation moved? Moved, Mr. Mayor. Is the recommendation seconded? Seconded, Mr. Mayor. Do any members would you like to move the recommendation? Say something first? No? Do any members wish to contribute? Shall we move straight to the vote? All those in favour of it? Sorry. Councillor Breale. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Right, I've read this report, but it doesn't go far enough. Uh, report 3.4, sorry, 3.14. It says in this report, the report provides an assurance to members that the council takes the stewardship of the cash very seriously. The last three complaints against me cost this council uh, £30,000. Councillor, we're not discussing you. I know no, you like no, to discuss you, but we're this not. Report. No, and we, it doesn't it's go not included. Sorry, Councillor, we're not having that. It doesn't go far Even enough. you must know that. What stick, to could I'm you stick to the down. report, please? I'm not sitting down. Could you st I didn't say sit down. I said, could you stick to the report, yeah, please? Yeah, the, re the report needs the to report go The report doesn't further. mention anything about you, I'm sure. No, but it mentions finances, and it mentions it should be, we should be looking more into the finances. Yes, 
If that's what you want to say, say it, but yes, don't I use am. yourself as an example, if you don't mind. We're not here to discuss you. I, I have made a request a number of times that these legal people running these finances is costing this council a lot of money on misleading lies from Councillor, complaints. I can't allow you to say that. Why? All right. Because misinformation. <laughs> there you go, you've got legal one ask... side, you've got the chief exit other. I know who they are. Well, they're giving you advice. I'd check it, Councillor. Of course they're they? giving me advice, and it's my choice whether I take it or not. Right. So I'm asking you again to stick to the point. The point is, right. the financials of this audit committee is extortion, and no checks are being made. Councillor, I'm going to have to ask you to stop talking now. Why? Because you're not sticking to the point. It's an audit report, isn't it? Yes. An and audit if you want report, to discuss the audit report... An audit report, report is about finances. The cost... Okay, I think you're going the off the point, that, Councillor. That now, I'm giving you, I'm giving read you read as much there, chance Councillor. as I can to stick to the point. That paragraph I've just read out there says they take everything seriously. And they do. About the finances. Well, and they that's do. all I want to talk about. Well, if you want to say that this Council takes the finances seriously, that's fine. Well, they need to go a little bit further. In well, my say opinion. that. Well, that's, that's a valid point for you to make. Yeah, they need to look at why they have substantial amounts of money being wasted on bogus complaints. But nothing seems Counsel to get done. Councillor, I'm sorry. You're just trying to bring your own personal things no, into this. I'm sorry. No, no. I think I've been more than fair, and I'm going to have to ask you to sit down. Well, because you're not sticking to the point. Yeah, yeah, you just, just seem to be to wasting all our time. Could you sit down, please? You listen to legal all the time. You're in serious trouble. They haven't told no, me to tell you to sit trouble. down. You're all a disgrace. Right. No one of the country. I'm certainly a disgrace, and I have been for a long time. Well, right. Hello, <laughs> yeah. Can we now move on to Councillor Jones, please? Thank you, Mr. First of all, Mr. Mayor, I think you're a fantastic job. I think you're... <laughs> hey, I'm sorry, Bob. You do... You, 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 you'll shut them down the same as you'll shut us down. And also, just to clarify, I, may, I had a complaint about councillors receiving advice, not the Mayor. The Mayor is meant to receive advice, so I understand that. Uh, very quick point. I think I'm within the realms of speaking on it. Uh, one about money being wasted. The only thing I'd like to see looked into with the standards would be looking at bringing a jury in to look at complaints with the councillors sitting as chairpersons. Uh, no political preference. You found guilty, no arguments. I think I might be going a bit off, so I'm going to leave it at there before you shut me down. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I was going to say perhaps you should put it in writing and give it to the standards committee. Oh, I wish I'd not shut up now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Maiden. Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm still waiting for these costs you promised me at three or four town hall meetings. I'm, st you I'm still waiting for the costs that right. I promised you. So you've you. not got them as well. So they haven't got, I haven't received any yet. Well, we yeah, can't. We have, I'm sorry, Councillor, but if the council hasn't received, we can't, we can't pass them on to you, can so, we? If we've so not can received we scrutinise the cost of these code of conduct? Well, we'll so have we to assume it's nil. If you're saying you want us run after people for pay a bill, them bills are in, come on. There's nobody done any work Councillor, 12 months in advance. If that information was available, it would have been given to me and I would have passed it on to you. So why has it been given to you? That's my question. No, what I'm saying is, no information has been given to me. That's what I said. All the information that I've received, you've received before. It's only a part of the hold information. On, you, hold, on, hold on, hold on. Just because it, you've not had the information doesn't mean there is no information. That's well, I... I Take the trouble that if an officer says they haven't got that information, it means they haven't got that information. So elaborate. I don't point. assume anything other than the that. Cost, the code of conduct hearings. But you've are raised too it again. It was raised in the past. It's been some considerable time now. It has. And I shall ask again. 
So for these okay. people in here who don't know, the cost of the code, the code of conduct earrings, yes, especially the cost of the, the code DW, of conduct of earrings was a lot less than the twenty thousand pounds what was claimed at that meeting. I never claimed that. I didn't say you did. Well, <laughs> I won't claim that because I've not had the costings. So um this is good, by the, the way, Mr. Burke. The, it's usually better than the. Uh, there's just there's the just foods. a part of the costings what hasn't been received. So the costings of the alleged independent adjudicator, which is not independent, the cost of the eye of the DW, and the cost of the paperwork and everything involved because it's semi-judicial. I'm still we, waiting four we, months down the line. And I, was proven I shall I shall oh. ask I shall ask again. Okay, thank you, Mr. Murphy. I think. <laughs> I think you were, you were presumed innocent until found guilty, councillor. As always, you wasn't found innocent. The, the, the charges were quashed. Councillor Halliwell. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Uh, again, it has been questioned about how cost-effective we spend our money, and I'll ask members to look at 3.12. There's a, a comment there where it says, from the Audit Committee report, it was pleasing to note that Mazars issued an unqualified, that's independent reporters, an unqualified opinion on the Council's 2019 financial statements, and reported that they were satisfied the Council had put in place proper arrangements to secure economy, efficiency, and effectiveness in its use of resources. And a qualified report, Mr. Murr, to prove that we spend our money effectively, regardless of what they say. No one else. Leader, do you wish to sum up? Oh, Deputy Leader? No necessity. No. Uh, <laughs> leader, do you wish to sum up? Yeah, just, just very quickly, Mr. Murr. I'm happy to move the report. Uh, there's a programme on TV at the moment called uh, I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. <laughs> and, 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 and tonight, it's felt like a bush took a trail. Uh, and, and you can start to think of some of the creatures that you meet in a bush took a trail. And tonight, I think I've met creatures far more significant than them. I'm happy to move the report, Mr. Mayor. We'll now move to the vote. All those in favour of accepting the recommendation as set out in the report, please show. All those against, that motion is carried. Questions and comments. Councillor Gerard wishes to ask the following question. Councillor Gerard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Matt. It's a lot to ask a question. Uh, I didn't realise I had five minutes to elaborate on it. So I'll have to look a bit ad hoc if I can. Uh, it's in relation basically to uh, historic buildings across the borough and uh, the rate at which they're, they're disappearing. Uh, <clears throat> the question basically is, can the leader please clarify the council's position on the core strategy, particularly CP11 part two, in regards to historical buildings such as the buildings in York Street, Atherton and others in the borough? CP112 states, encouraging the sympathetic and appropriate reuse of existing buildings and structures, especially those which make a pos positive co contribution to the special character of their locality and are identified at risk. Now, in Atherton, as you know, uh, we've had a couple of historic buildings in the past uh, disappear, the Formby Hall being one, and now We've got the risk with the latest council report of losing uh, a library and a tech building funded by Andrew Carnegie. Uh, I've done a bit of research on what the council have done in the past uh, saving buildings like this. And the only one I can come across uh, recently is the, uh, the chapels at Ince, the, the chapels there. And I think that was down to a bit of pressure from the uh, Victorian Society back in 2017, demanding that these uh, chapels would be uh, basically made good. Uh, two years down the lane after, the, after that, this year, the great fanfare, the, the council said that they're spending £100,000 
on these chapels. So the old adage is, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Uh, like I say, I just want some clarity. Are we, are we just saving some buildings or are we going to save some buildings what can have a proper use in the community again? And reconsider the report from the council uh, to dispose of the library and tech building in Atherton and let the good people of Atherton who, who put their idea hard work in to the community asset transfer and let them make a go of that building for the community. Thank you. I invite Councillor Halliwell to respond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd, again, I'd just like, if possible, uh, Councillor, just to give some background to what your, your question is. Uh, so the, the local plan core strategy which was adopted by the Council in September 2013, is the principal document in the development plan for the borough. Planning applications should be determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Core strategy policy CP11 aligns with the national policy framework, including paragraph 185, which states plans should set out a positive strategy for the conservation and enjoyment of the historic environment including heritage assets most at risk. It should take into account the desirability of the sustaining and enhancing the significance of the heritage assets and putting them to viable uses consistent with their conservation. The policy also reflects the fact that certain areas and buildings have a statutory protection through being designated in a conservation area or a listed building. These are known as designated heritage assets. Other buildings that are not listed or in the conservation area but still have some historic interest are called a non-designated heritage asset. The buildings at York Street are a non-designated heritage asset and as they are not listed and not in a conservation area so that by default they do not necessarily have any statutory protection and that is the guidance and the rules from English Heritage. The term at risk is what you've used in the, in the uh, question, is also a formal status determined by English er in Historic England as it is now, applying only to listed buildings and conservations as I've stated before. Although we acknowledge like in most towns, in provincial towns and in our, in our areas, um, and the vistas and views and, and the character of the streets and buildings uh, has some special meaning to us and we acknowledge that any heritage asset that can be at risk by virtue of its condition and the extent of active and viable use. I'd, I'd point out that in, in recent years, um, the council has only had one conservation officer and we've done very well to try and champion that heritage and some authorities don't even have a, a, a conservation officer. So I think it's fair to say that the distinction what's at risk and what isn't a designated act asset and what is a designated asset has to be carefully assessed and you've mentioned form be all and compared it with others but form be all was rejected by English Heritage for listing some some months or even years ago <coughs> well you made a statement about as assets disappearing and historic buildings and that the dichotomy is with a building that unless you can maintain it and upkeep it, it or even some buildings because of it changes become obsolescence and an old building has to have a use, it has to earn a living, any old building does, you can't just mothball and keep them there forever. And so it's a constant battle whether it's privately owned or whether it's owned by the council to try and find some viable use and, and keep that going. But not, not all the old buildings are designated as assets we do accept that they, are, they hold some special characteristics and that they do hold special interest in areas and it's the same in every single part. So we want to try and announce that and so that's why um, the, the council a few months ago, probably about a year or so ago, are now actively producing an historic environment strategy for the borough and which we're going to publish in, in the new year and it's already been out to consultation to some uh, heritage groups uh, across the borough. 
and we hope that this will help raise the profile of the borough's heritage assets and their potential to contribute to growth. So that it's a growth of the right kind that makes places where people want to be, whether that's living there, working there, volunteering there or spending their leisure time there. So while most heritage assets are not council owned, some are, and the strategies explain the means of how the council provides a way of trying to manage them assets within its ownership wherever we possibly can. And I just reiterate that whilst the buildings on York Street and Allerton are not designated heritage assets, we, we accept that they're important to the local community. So wherever we can, we will try and make sure we can find another use for them. But all of them, whether privately owned or owned by the council, a lot of them come with a quite a historic maintenance def deficit. And you can't just use normal materials. Councillor, I'm buildings. afraid you've run out of time. Okay, thank you, Governor. Uh, there are no notices of motion for consideration this evening. A motion has been submitted by Councillor Gerard, which is set out on page 112 of the agenda. The motion will be referred to Cabinet without debate in accordance with Rule of Procedure 9.7, and the motion will then come back to a future meeting of the Council for consideration. A motion has been submitted by Councillor Breeley, which is set out on page 112 of the agenda. The motion will be referred to Cabinet without debate in accordance with Rule of Procedure 9.8 and the motion will then come back to a future meeting of the Council for consideration. As a reminder, can I ask you to remember to fill out the form relating to your iPads and leave your iPads behind for the necessary upgrades. That concludes the business before us tonight. Thank you for your attendance and safe journey home. And may I take this opportunity of wishing you the compliments of the season to you and your families. And don't forget the book of condolences for uh, Councillor Murphy, should you wish to sign it. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>